Hi everybody. I want to get right into this particular video because it's lengthy. There's several scriptures I want to read and discuss. And it's actually going to be covering two topics, two different things that on the surface they may not appear to be relatable, but in reality they are relatable. Now, I already know that this is going to cause cognitive dissidence in a lot of people, and a lot of you are going to say, wow, how did I miss this? Many of you friends have emailed Kim and I and actually phone called with your, with your personal thanks for the video I had recently done regarding the Lord's Prayer and the quotation marks within the quotation marks in realizing that Jesus' disciples said, teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples. And we all realize at that point that you have a quote within a quote. It's not Jesus' original prayer. That has caused some of you to start researching a little bit more about John the Baptist. And we have received um, several questions. But there happened to be one question that kind of like goes right to the top of all of the questions. And it's that question that I'm going to discuss but before I get into that friends I have to go back just a little bit and talk further on the Lord's Prayer something respecting the Lord's Prayer that we've also missed what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a comparison between a couple of different Bibles and one of them happens to be the Revised Standard Version. So that we are all clear and we all comprehend what the Revised Standard Version is, I want to read a few lines from the preface. Okay, so that way there, we do comprehend why we have the Revised Standard Version. The Revised Standard Version of the Bible is an authorized version of the American Standard Version published in 1901. Now, I happen to have a 1901 and I'm not going to be opening it and reading it because it's pretty old and it's pretty used. But, so this Revised Standard is a revision of the 1901, which was a revision of the King James Version 1611. Now, thanks to Jason Zelda, I have a 1611, a copy of the 1611 King James Version. Because I noticed that Jason Zelda held this up quite a bit in his videos, and I wanted a copy because I actually like Bibles that have flexible covers. So I have that version. So skipping down a few more paragraphs, I want to read this. The King James Version had to compete with the Geneva Bible in popul popular use, but in the end, it prevailed. And for more than two and a half centuries, no other authorized translation of the Bible into English was made. The King James Version became the authorized version of the English-speaking people. Next paragraph. The King James Version has, with good reason, been termed the noblest monument of English prose. Its revisers in 1881 expressed admiration for its simplicity, its dignity, its power, its happy turns of expression. Dot, dot, dot. The music of its cadness 
and the felicities of its rhythm. It entered as no other book has into the making of the personal character and the public institutions of the English speaking world. We owe to it a incalculable debt. Next paragraph. Yet the King James Version has grave defects. <laughs> has grave defects. And as I mentioned in the previous video regarding the Lord's Prayer, when you don't have quotation marks, the reader does not comprehend that those words might be taken from other places. You just don't have that. Now the Revised Standard Version does put the quotation marks where they belong. But just to repeat, Yet, the King James Version has grave defects. Now, what I want to do is I want to take a look at one of those defects. <laughs> and you can actually find it in the Lord's Prayer. Let's go to Matthew, chapter 6. And we'll just read verse 9. Here again, I'm reading this from the 1611 Version. Chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's all I want to read is just the opening portion of that prayer because I want to compare to Luke's version. Chapter 11, verse 2. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be a defect, does there? See? When you pray, Our Father which art in heaven, Matthew says the same thing. Our Father which art in heaven. I want to read those same two scriptures from the Revised Standard. So let's go to Matthew chapter 6, and we'll read verse 9. Pray then like this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Says the same thing as the 1611, doesn't it? Our Father, who art in heaven. Now let's go to Matt, uh, Luke chapter 11. And let's compare. Luke chapter 11, verse 2 from the Revised Standard. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Wait, 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 wait. Father, hallowed be. Where is who art in heaven? Seems to me like Luke, under divine inspiration, and according to chapter 1, thoroughly investigated all of this. Forgot a few little tittles. Our Father who art in heaven. No, he just goes right to Father, hallowed be thy name. Revised Standard Version. Which is a, what was it that this said? Which was a revision of the King James Version published in 1611. Going back down reading from the preface, yet the King James Version has grave defects. It looks to me like Luke left out who are in heaven in the Lord's Prayer. Now friends, what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to Isaiah chapter 66. I wanted to read verses 1 through 4. What we're going to notice that in both the 1611 and the 1901 versions, without the quotation marks, the reader is led to believe that Jehovah is having Isaiah dictate one continuous conversation. See, this is what you miss when you read from a Bible 
such as the 1611 and the 1901 King James Version, you miss the quotation marks. You miss proper grammar. So when you read this set of scriptures from the 1611 King James Version without the quotation marks, you have no idea that these words are actually taken from other places. Chapter 66, starting with verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye built unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an obligation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions, and I will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. There are no quotation marks in what I just read. So what I want to do is I want to read this from the Revised Standard. Now you Jehovah's Witnesses and or ex-Jehovah's Witnesses that still have your New World Trash Translation, you can follow along because the New World Translation does exactly what's been done in the Revised Standard. Isaiah chapter 66, and we will read verses 1 through 4, I believe it was. This time what I'm going to do is I'm going to note the quotation marks. Remember, the 1611 doesn't use quotation marks, so you don't know that this is not a one continuous speak, that it's a bunch of words taken from other sources and put into one, one sentence structure as if Jehovah spoke all these words to Isaiah at one time. So, like I said, you can follow along in the New World Translation because it does the same thing. Thus says the Lord, quote, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house which you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things are mine, saith the Lord. Doesn't end the quote there. There's no end quote. It just goes on. But this is the man to whom I look. He that is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Verse 3. Quote, he who slaughters in... Wait, wait, wait. There's no end of quote. Verse 2. It doesn't end the quote. So why does it go on with another quote? But first of all, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house which you would build for me? Didn't he say those same words to David? When David wanted to build a house for Yahweh? Did you guys all catch that? Or does it just go in one ear and right out the other because there's no quotation marks? You have to realize that what Isaiah is doing here is he's quoting it from another source. Number three. Now remember, verse two didn't end with any quotes. It just starts another quote, but it doesn't end it. So verse three, quote, He who slaughters an ox is like him who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like him, uh, um, is like him who breaks a dog's neck. 
he who presents a cereal offering like him who offers swine's blood. He who makes a memorial offering of frankincense like him who blesses an idol. These have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. I also will choose affliction for them and bring their fears upon them because when I called no one answered when I spoke they did not listen but they did what was evil in my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight powerful words powerful words you see friends when others are using the 1611 King James Version it's easy to mislead you when you cannot backtrack where these quotes are coming from and it's even easier for someone using a 1611 King James to mislead you when there are no quotation marks so before I go on so as an added point do you friends remember what Revelation 21 1 says if not go to Isaiah 65 and we will just read verse 17 Isaiah 65 verse 17 for behold I create new heavens and a new earth and the former things shall not be rem isn't this what John writes at Revelation 21 1 and I saw a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness is to dwell that's right the book of Revelation in that particular part is plagiarized from Isaiah chapter 65 verse 17 so really doesn't that by extension invalidate a revelation if you are borrowing scriptures from the Old Testament and making them apply in the New Testament as a new revelation then it's not a revelation it's called plagiarizing and it's happened a lot throughout these books now what I really want to do here also friends now for the rest of this for this purpose I want to use the New World trash translation but you need to get the old one not the silver sword because Watchtower has taken out a lot of the cross references and this is where it becomes very very eye-opening because I want to refer you back to Isaiah chapter 66 in verse 3 the one slaughtering the bull is as one striking down a man okay do you see that little X right there that takes you to the footnote because what Watchtower is doing now is they're wanting you to cross-reference some scriptures now how many of us as Jehovah's Witnesses really 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 took the time to cross-reference these scriptures I'll put my hand up I didn't I only cross-reference the scriptures that I could use in service to screw with someone else's mind because that's how Watchtower trained us just use these specific scriptures and then just use those cross references but look at what this cross reference does okay it takes you to Isaiah chapter 1 so flip over to Isaiah chapter 1 now in this particular case X does mark the spot I want to start by reading verse 10 now although the X takes you to Isaiah 1 11, I want to read all of this because I want you friends you Jehovah's Witnesses in particular to comprehend something Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10 Hear the word of Jehovah, you dictators of Sodom. Give ear to the law of your God, you people of Gomorrah. Quote, 
See, presumably, Isaiah is quoting the words from Jehovah as Jehovah is dictating them. Verse 11, Of what benefit to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says Jehovah? I have had enough of whole burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed animals and in the blood of young bulls and male lambs and he goats I have taken no delight when you people keep coming to me to see my face who is it that has required this from your hands to trample my courtyards stop bringing in any more valueless grain offerings incense it is something detestable to me new moon and Sabbath the calling of a convention I cannot put up with the use of uncanny power along with the solemn assembly your new moons in your festival your festal seasons my soul has hated to me they have become a burden I have become tired of bearing them but you're never gonna read that in a synagogue or a kingdom hall or a Baptist church or an Orthodox church Catholic church you ain't gonna read those scriptures are you but yet Watchtower knows because they're the one that put the X in 66 verse 3 and takes you to this scripture now to comprehend even further I want to read from my archaeological study Bible regarding the authorship of Isaiah now keep in mind, this is not from Watchtower now. This is from the people that put together the, uh, the NIV, the New International Version. Just going to read the first paragraph, and then I'm going to skip over just a little bit. Isaiah. Although once universally accepted as the work of one man, Isaiah the son of Amos, the book of Isaiah is now widely believed to have been written by various authors over the course of several centuries. The standard multi-author theory claims that Isaiah had at least three authors. Hmm, am I beginning to validate that theory of multiple authors? wait for it so I'm going over to the next column and I'm going to be reading right from this little section right here all of Isaiah is concerned with Canaanite idolatry while scholars would accept such a focus from first Isaiah they would not anticipate it in second or third Isaiah Let's see, when you slaughter a bull, it's like breaking a man's neck. When you slaughter a lamb, it's like breaking a dog's... See, they didn't anticipate Canaanite worship being exposed with the nation of Israel, did they? They didn't expect it, but yet it's there. Going on, it was not a significant issue to post-textolic prophets such as Zechariah, Haggai, or Malachi interesting now I do want to read further regarding verse 14 because if you friends noticed it says right here going back your uh, verse 13 notice where it says new moon the N is capitalized as if it is a proper name new moons and then when you go down to verse 14 it says your new moons small n so you have a proper name of a celebration and then you have all the other celebration of new moons 
Verse 14, I want to read the footnote from my archaeological study Bible. The observance of new moon festivals. Now keep in mind, I know the camera can't show it, but this right here uses the capital N on new moon festivals. Okay, so it's capital N, capital M also. Okay, the observance of new moon festivals which were celebrated on the first day of every Hebrew month included special sacrifices and feasts. Appointed feasts refer to the more significant annual celebrations such as Passover. But Jehovah said he had enough of that. In Isaiah chapter 1, they were disgusting to him. But yet, the researchers that put all of these footnotes together are acknowledging celebrations such as Passover. Weeks, which is the Pentecost, you know, the weeks of tabernacles. Is that sinking in to some of you friends? The observance of new moon festivals, which were celebrated on the first day of every Hebrew month, included special sacrifices and feasts. Appointed feasts referred to the more significant annual celebrations, such as Passover. See, it really doesn't matter what you call them to detract from what's really going on. It's widely acknowledged. Now... But notice it mentioned they're concerned with Canaanite idolatry. So, what I want to do is I want to reread verses 11 through 15, but this time I need to do it in a different context so that we can all grasp what's going on in these scriptures so that we can all comprehend what's actually going on here I'm going to do something that's going to definitely upset a lot of people and I've had many conversations with Orthodox Christians regarding some of this stuff one of them being Jason Zelda because see Jason Zelda believes that Jesus is the God in the Old Testament now it's easy to come to that conclusion because of the book, the Gospel of John. You know where Jesus says, before Abraham, I am. Well, take the King James Version, go back to the burning bush, I am that I am. Oh, so Jesus is God. Before Abraham, I am. So it's easy to come to that conclusion. So what I want to do is I want to reread those scriptures in Isaiah chapter 1. But instead of saying Jehovah and or instead of saying Jesus, I'm going to replace that with the I am. Because that's in essence what we should all be doing, right? Think about it, friends. It's not difficult. Verse 10, however, the words of I am... You dictators of Sodom, give ear to the law of your God. You people of Gomorrah, of what benefit to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says I am? I have had enough of whole burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of well-fed animals, and the blood of young bulls. In male lambs and he goats, I have taken no delight. When you people keep coming in to see my face, who is it that has required this of your hand? Trample my courtyards. Stop bringing in any more valueless grain offerings, incense. It is something detestable to me. New moon and Sabbath. The calling of a convention. I cannot put up with the use of uncanny power along with the solemn assembly. Interesting, solemn. 
Uh, Sol, S-O-L. Isn't that Latin for sun? I digress. Your new moons and your festival seasons, my soul has hated. To me, they have become a burden. I have become tired of bearing them. And when you spread out your palms, I hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I am not listening with bloodshed. Your very hands have become filled. I am is asking a question. I am is asking it. Who is it that has required this of you? I am was at the burning bush telling Moses to institute all of these Sabbaths, all of these festivals. I am is the one doing that. How come I am can't recall the mind who told them to do all of this? Before Abraham, I am. I am was at the burning bush, but yet I am can't recall who told Israel to do all these sacrifices, to observe all these festivals, including the Sabbath, including all their new moon celebrations, which, you know, the Passover is on, you know, on a, uh, you know, moon, full moon festival. Is it sinking in? Finally, people... Now, as a side point, go back to verse 15. And when you spread out your palms, I hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I am not listening. <laughs> so that you friends can see who I am is hiding from cross-reference that scripture cross-reference that scripture and see who I am Jehovah Jesus Yahweh is hiding from and when you do that don't forget to look at Amos chapter 5 verses 18 through 25 and pay attention to the words now, by now, I'm sure you're all asking, how does this relate to John the Baptist? Well, I'm going to now show you. The question that several of you have sent to us is found at Matthew 11, verse 3. This is when John the Baptist was in prison. And John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus this question. Are you the expected one? Or do we look for someone else? <laughs> Wait a minute. Are you the expected one? Or should we look for someone else? It's interesting to see how an apologist tackles this question. Okay, the question goes on, didn't John know who Jesus was, especially that he was the Messiah, since John baptized Jesus and also heard God the Father speak about Jesus? He heard God the Father speak about Jesus. On what other occasion in any of the Gospels do you hear Jehovah speaking to John about Jesus other than at the baptism? And the Holy Spirit. This is my son, the beloved. How many other occasions in the Gospels do you read Jehovah speaking to John? <laughs> you don't. Do you? This question is a very misleading question. But I want to tackle a apologist's answer regarding this. And I have to admit that I read this to XJW Elder's wife, Jane Doe, and we had a laugh, I'm telling you, because it's ludicrous, okay? And I'm going to show you why it's ludicrous. This is the answer. That is a very good question. 
in one that I wondered about for a long time. Oh, come on. Give me a break. There ain't one Christian on this earth that wondered why John's asking that question. Not one. Because we just are not taught to think in those terms. Give me a break. To understand why John asked such a question, you have to understand that he was in prison and had only stories about the man he sent his disciples to go and see. Weren't they cousins? What do you mean they had only stories? I mean, my goodness, how big was that whole Palestinian area? My God, you, you could walk from Egypt to J Jerusalem within a matter of a day. Everywhere Jesus went, curing the sick, raising the dead, blessing the food, feeding the multitudes. That demographic isn't that large, people. They were cousins for crying out loud. See, but that's not talked about because, oh, no, 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 you're not supposed to see that they were cousins. So he had only stories? Give me a break. He goes on, and since there were a few imposters, <laughs> since there were a few imposters at that time claiming to be the Messiah, well, see, that's what you have to understand is the historical context. They were looking for somebody to get them out from under the control of the Roman law, the Roman authorities. So anybody that would have stood up against not only the Roman authorities, but hey, hey, perhaps maybe even Herod's authority, because that's what John was doing. He was exposing publicly Herod's relationship with his sister-in-law in law being adulterous. Okay? So Herod was committing adultery with his sister-in-law. And John was pointing that out. And since there were a few imposters at that time claiming to be the Messiah, John sent his disciples to ask him a direct question, knowing that the Messiah, knowing that the Messiah, including the person he baptized, would give an answer that only the Messiah would give? How would you know that? As an apologist, how would you know that John the Baptist is asking this question that only the true Messiah would answer? How do you know that? You don't. You're adding something to the theology that you can't back up, that you can't prove. Because you don't have any scriptures showing that Jesus as the Messiah would give the only answer that his cousin John the Baptist would recognize. You know, and I'm keep Keep in mind, friends, keep in mind, John the Baptist is the one that heard God's voice. This is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. Listen to him. And keep in mind that we do not have the actual word for word quotation that he, you don't have the word for word? Then why do you have in the writing? Are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? If you don't have the word for word, then why does this question even appear to be a word for word question? <laughs> wow! But then he goes on. But it's not hard to imagine. <laughs> That's the same crap watchtower pulls. It's safe to assume. It's the same crap watchtower pulls, isn't it? But it's not hard to imagine that John asked his disciples to go and see if the man he had been hearing so much about was the same man that he baptized in the Jordan River. Also, keep in mind that because John knew he wouldn't be alive much longer, how do you know that John knew that? How do you know? that John knew that. How do you know that when you read the scripture that Herod, according to the scripture, was afraid to put John to death? Go back and read the stories, friends, because this apologist is adding stuff to the storyline that you cannot confirm. It's the same crap Watchtower pulls. Wow, wouldn't be alive much longer. 
he wanted to make sure that he wouldn't be sending his disciples disciples to follow a false messiah so he wanted to ensure this was the person that he had baptized <laughs> again it was his cousin again this apologist answer assumes a lot so what we need to do friends is we need to go back and read a little bit about John the Baptist don't we so what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to Luke's account because you remember Luke thoroughly investigated all of this so Luke's account has to be the most accurate account out there I want to start with verse 5 because there's a lot of things in this account friends that we miss it actually is because we don't focus on this all we do is focus on I am in the beginning was the word and the word became flesh you forget the importance of this verse 5 in the days of Herod king of Judah there happened to be a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth they both were righteous before God because of walking blamelessly in accord with all the commandments and legal requirements of Jehovah or oh, excuse me <clears throat> I am verse 7 but they had no child because Elizabeth or excuse me because Sarah was Barren, wait, excuse me, because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were well along in years. Did you catch the Abraham and Sarah motif right there? See, I put Sarah's name in there on purpose so that you would be quick to identify this is an ancient motif that goes all the way back. It's a typology story. This is a type. Doesn't mean it's not real doesn't mean that it's that it's a, a fake story they're just using an ancient motif they're trying to tie all of this back into Abraham and Sarah Sarah was barren but there's a difference in this story and it goes unnoticed and it goes unchallenged see in the Abraham and Sarah motif Sarah laughs. <laughs> yeah, I'm old. I can't have a child. <laughs>, laughs at Jehovah. I mean, excuse me, laughs at I am. In this instance, Zechariah is made silent until he declares the name John. Big bad John. It's the same motif, friends. It's the same story, just recanted with different names in a different set of circumstances. But there's an also bigger problem than what I just mentioned. Remember what Isaiah 113 read? Did you forget already? 113. Let's go back to Isaiah. Let's reread that because see, Zechariah is doing what? He's a temple priest isn't he Isaiah chapter 1 verse 13 stop bringing in any more valueless grain offerings incense it is something detestable to me so you gotta ask why is the angel Gabriel blessing Jack Zachariah with I am's words that they're gonna have a child and this child is going to be filled with Holy Spirit when Zechariah is plainly doing something that I am found detestable I want to read something from once again my archaeological study Bible on page 1665 regarding Zechariah there's a little footnote down here and I've got an asterisk next to it so you can see exactly where I'm reading from this is what it says 
it was one of the priest's duties to keep the incense burning on the altar in front of the most holy place. He supplied it with fresh incense before the morning sacrifice and again after the evening sacrifice. But yet in Isaiah chapter 1, the burning of incense, I am, finds it disgusting, detestable. So you've got to ask, why is I am, Jehovah, or Jesus sending Gabriel down to tell a priest that I'm going to bless you with this holy, holy spirit filled child when that priest is doing something detestable in the eyes of I am? Why? Also bear in mind, friends, that Jesus is also painted as God in the flesh. So you read at Luke chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, that, you know, God, I am, goes into a synagogue, and he pulls out the scroll of Isaiah. He unrolls it to where it says, um, Jehovah's Spirit has filled me, or however that scripture is read. And then he rolls it up, puts it away, says, today that scripture is fulfilled. Don't you find it a little disconcerting that I am goes into a synagogue, pulls out a scripture from Isaiah, and says, um, you know, Jehovah's Spirit is upon me, and these words are fulfilled, but yet he neglects to read to a synagogue full of people that's still celebrating the Passover, still celebrating new moon, still, still uh, holding to the Sabbaths, that he doesn't read from Isaiah chapter 1, where I am, finds all of these Sabbaths detestable. He hates the sacrifices. He hates the grain offerings. He's become tired of all of this. Wouldn't it have been much more beneficial for I am to not roll that entire scroll open and find that one little section? It would have been much better off just to open up a little bit and let them people know that what they're doing is disgusting to him as I am. It's, it's almost as if Jesus finds no value in those words or they didn't exist at all in Jesus' day. Now, for the final issue, get your Bibles, and we're going to go to John chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 15. Look at verse 15. Do you see the brackets? This is a inserted verse. Now, how come Christians don't have a problem with this? John bore witness about him. Yes, he actually cried out. This is the one who said, crying, the one coming behind me has advanced in front of me because he existed before me. Oh, I am. I am. But that verse is inserted. But yet again, it's presented as if, as if John the Baptist was a prophet isn't it? Right? Because they have to sell the identity of I am, or as Jesus, as God in the flesh, and that he existed in the heavens before even John the Baptist. But it's a inserted scripture. But you read this same thing from the 1611 King James? There's no insertion marks. So the reader has no idea that this scripture has been inserted. None whatsoever. It's very deceptive, isn't it? So if you friends really pour over the Gospels and read more about John's death, there is nothing that even indicates that John the Baptist spoke these words. So where is Luke? You know, the one that researched everything, thoroughly investigated, if he thoroughly investigated all of this, and why are he in, why is he inserting something that you cannot backtrack and find the source? Can't do it. It's almost like there's a different manuscript being inserted here. If you really take the time to read this story regarding John's death, there is nothing 
that leads the reader to believe that John the Baptist ever spoke these words that are inserted here. Nothing. It's almost like, you know, when you look at John chapter 8 and all of those missing verses, because even Watchtower admits that there are different manuscripts. Some have these verses, some don't, but when you read the 1611 King James, it does not let the reader comprehend that. You read it as if these ver verses are exact fact, coming right out of Jehovah's mouth, or Yahweh's mouth, or Jesus' mouth, or even I Am's mouth. Nothing to indicate that. Now what I want to do is I want to show further something that does come out of John the Baptist's mouth, if you will. John chapter 1, we're going to read verses 19 through 23. Now this, I'm going to, reading it from the New World Translation. Now this is the witness of John. When the Jews sent forth priests and Levites from Jerusalem to him to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Therefore they said to him, Who are you? that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say for yourself? He said, I am a voice of someone crying out in the wilderness. Make the way of Jehovah straight, just as Isaiah the pro... Oh! So they have to put the words of Isaiah in the mouth of John the Baptist, don't they? But see... To ask a question like, are you the Messiah or should we expect someone else? Look at verse 29. Remember, when Mary went to go visit Elizabeth, when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, the baby inside of Elizabeth jumped for joy because it was full of Holy Spirit. Full of Holy Spirit. And he's got to ask, are you the Messiah? Verse 29, the next day he beheld I am coming toward him. Oh, that's not what it says. The next day he beheld Jesus coming toward him. He said, see the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. With that statement, is there any doubt that John the Baptist knows exactly who I am, I mean, who Jesus is. Is there any doubt? No. But when he's in jail, oh, all of a sudden, John the Baptist has got doubt. Do you see the ridiculousness of this, friends? It's ridiculous. People are dying for the words in this book, Jehovah's Witnesses. People are dying because your religious knuckleheads don't take the time to explain this stuff to you. Even some of your other religious wannabe leaders don't take the time to read the book and figure out that they themselves are misleading you when they say, Jesus is the God in the Old Testament because you know he told the Pharisees before Abraham I am so I am was at the burning bush hey keep dying keep surrendering your lives really doesn't matter to me what you do with it because you are a free divine sovereign being do what you want with your own sovereignty I'm just here to help those that can't identify yet what exactly is going on in this book and they are willing to lay their lives down for what they do not know. So in conclusion here friends so that I get all my bases covered I would find it very disappointing if an Orthodox Christian somewhere along the way would refer me 
to Colossians 2 verses 16 through 19, you know where Paul famously says, don't judge anybody in the celebration of a new moon or in the celebration of a Sabbath, yada, yada, yada. You don't need to do that because I am Jesus, Jehovah, Yahweh, makes it very clear how he feels about all those sacrifices, how he feels about you holding the Sabbath, how he feels about you celebrating the new moon with a capital N, and all of the other new moons without the capital N. It's disgusting to him. And yet at the same time, <laughs> at the same time he's got the nerve to ask, who taught you all these things? Who, who told you to do this stuff? Just don't read with a level of understanding, with a level of comprehension. So Jehovah's Witnesses, you have a choice to make. Some Orthodox Christians, you have a choice to make. Either you find your freedom from the religious regurgitators, or you just continue to die for a book that you do not read with any level of comprehension. Now this is a hard-hitting video because when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses, you're still willing to die for the contents of this book. And there's no need for it because it does contradict itself. It's as simple as that. Thanks for watching and may the cognitive dissidents clear away very quickly. <laughs> Bye.